What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Long Game Podcast hosted by Thomas Kopelman and Trayton DeVore. In each episode, you'll hear us break down financial topics that are relevant to the lives of millennials and other young professionals. Our goal is to help bring credible financial information to you in short, bite-sized episodes. Thomas Kopelman and Trayton DeVore are the co-founders and financial planners at All Street Wealth. All opinions expressed by Thomas and Trayton are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of All Street Wealth. This podcast is for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It should not be considered advice. Please consult with your financial advisor, tax, legal, and any other advisors you have before making any decisions regarding your financial plan. All right. What's up and welcome back everyone to another episode of the Long Game Podcast. Today I'm joined again by Christopher Guype. Um, I'm not sure if you guys went back and listened to the first episode, but he's this awesome attorney. We ended up meeting on Twitter and we've done a really great episode on basically asset protection. And we're going to do a part two today on that. Um, You know, I don't know if this is fair to say, but I've met a lot of attorneys and most attorneys that I speak with are obviously really educated, but they're not the most interesting to listen to. And that's why we brought Chris back for part two, because he has this great combo of the two where he's knowledgeable, he can explain things well, and he isn't boring. So there's your little tee up and the compliments I got to give you. I was going to say, I appreciate that. Hopefully, uh, I mean, the, the, the standard has now been set. So um, I, I appreciate that. Thanks for having me back. And I'm excited to be here and provide yeah. some value and hopefully uh, educate more people and get them thinking about things that they may not have considered before. For sure. And I think this is a piece where like most advisors ignore, I think in general, like you were tweeting about this last week that like advisors are starting to spend more time educating on estate planning. And like, if you're going to do that, you need to become educated because I'm with you. I see advisors talk about things all the time. And I'm like, that's not even close to accurate. I, I don't know what you're saying. But on top of that, I think this is like step two of estate planning, right? Like you can't just talk estate planning without actually talking about asset protection because they do go hand in hand. And so I think, you know, the best way to lay the foundation and start this episode is one, go back and listen to the episode last episode first. But if you don't want to do that, Chris, like, let's just kind of start off with like what asset protection is and why it's really important. Sure. Yeah. And um, as you mentioned, uh Asset protection is kind of the natural progression of estate planning, right? Most people think of estate planning, that's going to be kind of the foundation. If we're talking about building blocks, that's going to be like, you know, the first block is, you know, incapacity planning, um, you know, planning for legacy, what happens kind of after, you know, we pass away, we leave this earth, all of those things. Um, Asset protection is the next step. Um, and, and even if we go back to your previous podcast, and if you didn't check out the podcast with Frazier Rice, it was awesome talking about estate tax planning. That would kind of be part three. Asset protection kind of fits this middle wedge of, hey, we have a foundational estate plan. We may not have a taxable estate, but we have assets. And so asset protection is, is simply the way that we organize our assets and the way that we protect them from third-party creditors, lawsuits, um, business disputes, potential, you know, uh, divorces in the future. It kind of occupies that gap and it serves a bunch of different functions to put you in the best position possible so that you can continue to grow your business, your wealth, your portfolio, all of those things. Yeah. I think the, it's funny. We were talking ahead of this podcast and you were saying like, hey, I think there's some gaps from the last week, right? And and what we talked about last week was all about 2026 is coming, how to plan ahead of that and really around the exemption and, and tax planning in general. And there's urgency there, but there actually might be even more urgency on this side, right? Because there's no tax laws coming that are going to make you at more risk of losing your wealth. That could come today. It could come tomorrow. It could come in an accident. Like who knows? But that risk is always there, even though most of us don't see it or think about it. 100%. And um, urgency is also a a big component in asset protection planning because this is one of the few things, kind of like uh, 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 various insurance products, right? As soon as you have an event, right? Uh, some liability producing event, you're, you're sued, a lawsuit in is initiated. Your ability to plan at that point in time um, becomes extremely difficult, if not nearly impossible. Because um, 
asset protection is something that you can only engage in and do when you have, you know, smooth waters and, yeah, and there is no sued. conflict. Yeah, you can't get sued and open a trust and move your assets into it and then go to the court and say, I have 50 bucks left in my name. I don't know what you want. I mean, you could. Uh, you'd probably be looking at criminal charges at that point. <laughs> we have these things that are called fraudulent conveyance laws, um, which I impose criminal penalties for doing that type of thing, right? You cannot engage in the process of asset protection for the purposes of defrauding creditors. That's fraud. That's and not only you know will those assets likely be clawed back, but now you're getting yourself an even uh, stickier situation, as opposed to being proactive, preventative in you know engaging in this when you really should, which is kind of like right now, right? Um, if you're listening to this, if you have some assets, if you have some wealth. Um, this is the best opportunity and the best time to plan. There is no, you know, artificial deadline that may or may not be coming in January 2026, depending on, you know, who's voted into office, who's not. Asset protection planning should always be a concern. And um, to be fair and to be honest, you never get to those complex estate tax questions unless your underlying assets are protected. Right. Because even if you're in that category of um, 15 to 20 million or, you know, whatever the categories that kind of you and Fraser had discussed last week, um, if you have one lawsuit that wipes out 85 percent of your wealth, which happens all the time, um, the estate tax problem has solved itself. You've lost the business. You've lost the company. You've lost the portfolio. And that's way all of the way around it for sure. Just yeah. Give it, give it, it away in a lawsuit. And, and and I and I see it way too often, right? Is I just met with a client um, last week, wonderful person, um, you know, in the medical professional space, um, and she sold her business uh, to a private equity firm and did amazing on the sale. And then you know we're going, we're meeting with the advisors and kind of reviewing her balance sheet. And, you know, here we are in the 25 plus million dollar category and 95% of her wealth is just located in a revocable living trust that has zero asset protection. So, I mean, this individual is one car accident away, one uh, tenant dispute away from potentially seeing a vast sum of her wealth lost Yeah, I, simply I mean, because it's an unprotected asset. Yeah, I want to go into that. And I think before I ask some of the tools that are considered in that situation, because I do want to weave in practical thoughts and advice of how your brain would go here is that that space is a little bit easier, right? Like the 20 to 25, most people are like, I'm comfortable. I know I could carve out maybe five to 10 million. I'm good for the rest of my life. Like, let's protect this easy. It is a lot harder for people that are five to 10 is what I found. Like if you're 7 million net worth in your fifties, to like move money into your revocable trust is hard for uh -huh. people to start to fathom. And that's sometimes where the thinking about asset class or, you know, wealth ranges, like hundred million net worth person, super easy to tell them why to move money out of their name because they can just understand that they're totally fine. Lower wealth people are like, Ooh, is what's, what's the downside? Like, am I never going to touch that again? You know, what could that hurt? Am I going to be okay? There, there's totally different ways to approach those conversations. Yes, but I think, um, I guess to answer your question, we first have to understand the ways in which we deploy asset protection, because it's actually pretty simple. There's really only three things that you can do to protect an asset. Um, you can give it away, and that's what you're talking about, giving it to kids, giving it to an irrevocable trust, um, transferring it out of your name so it's no longer my asset, right? That's one way to do it. Um, Another way to do it is to lock it behind an entity. So using business structures. Um, this also kind of coincides with number one because you can also you know, give it away or lock it behind an irrevocable trust. The third way that we can do it is to encumber the property, right? It's called equity stripping. If we reduce the amount of equity in something, it makes it a less attractive asset to go off of. And yeah. so in time, you know, in what you're saying, yes, it, it becomes a much easier conversation the more wealth that we accumulate and the more wealth that we gather. But it's actually more important for smaller clients 
right? Because if you have a $100 million asset or a $100 million client, if they get hit with a 4 or $5 million lawsuit, that would totally suck. But at the end of the day, they're going to be able to weather the storm yeah. very simply, very easily. But if you have a client who has a net worth of $2 million, $3 million, they've done well for themselves. You know, in my experience, most of the time dealing with California clients, that means that, hey, they have their primary house. Um, they may have one investment property and then they have some assets in the bank. Usually that's enough to get most of my clients to the two, $3 million mark here in Southern California. Um, those clients, it's even more detrimental to be facing that lawsuit because that lawsuit could effectively set you back to very close near zero. Yeah. Um, the only thing, I mean, at that point in time, the only thing preventing that is, you know, filing bankruptcy proof in, in seeking bankruptcy protection. And so when we consider kind of the options that we have available before we even get to giving this to irrevocable trusts, right, which is definitely an option, but that's an option that we explore for higher net worth clients who have more assets, who again, can also, they're probably also considering other things, right? Like estate tax planning, income tax planning. There are other considerations just beyond asset protection. For the clients in, you know, the one to $3 million category, which is a lot of people, uh, especially nowadays, um, asset protection is probably going to be the bigger driving force. And, and so kind of practical applications. Um, I represented a client, elderly gentleman, um, him and his wife have a single family home. They also had a triplex, right? Nothing crazy, nothing fancy. They bought it probably 50, 60 years ago. And they've just kept it ever since. They worked normal jobs. And so they've had the benefit of having mass appreciation for where they bought the houses. And um, now they're both retired well into their 80s. And husband was involved in a car accident. This car accident, unfortunately, resulted in a, in a fatality. But here you, you know, it was completely by accident, by total happenstance. And here we are kind of looking at the potential ramifications of this is, you know, they have equity in their home. Their triplex is completely paid off, which is what they survive off of. And then they have a little bit of money in the bank. And then you go and you look at the underlying insurance policies and they didn't have great insurance. And so this is where asset protection comes into play is because asset protection is designed to protect your assets and then provide in, in a big conversation of asset protection is also looking at your underlying insurance. Because if we have um, insurance that our creditors can go after, what we want to do is encourage them, yes, go after the insurance money. That's why we pay for it. But then to stop there, and to make the remaining assets difficult to get to so that once they get the insurance money, it's no longer in the client's benefit or it's going to be too difficult to penetrate the other underlying assets. For sure. And I, so- I was just going to say, I mean, for us, like that's why every single client we bring on has to get a financial plan. Like there's a lot of advisors who are like, you know, we'll just manage your assets. We'll just talk about what you want to talk about. But like, you're neglecting this massive piece, right? You grab a $5 million portfolio, but you don't know that their auto is not maxed, that they might not have liability coverage on that. Like we just went through, we have a client who his business will do 24 million revenue this year. And he had waived on all of their auto policies, any coverage to protect the other person, like waived them, right? So you get in a car accident and that person has high medical costs, any issues, like nothing there, no umbrella coverage. Like this is totally step one of what has to be looked at. And most people just pick the cheapest insurance, right? They're like, I need to do this for my state. I'm going to pick it. And I have $25,000 of coverage. And it's like, that's Which, like yeah, the opposite and, of what you want it for. You want it for the other side of this. And, and in California, the same way, 1530 is what we see. Thankfully, my client had a little bit more than this, but it puts you in a super precarious position because if there's no insurance money for the person to collect off, right? And it, in in um, the context of a car accident, you may totally be at fault. You may have looked, you may have reached down to answer your phone, um, may have gotten distracted by something or just simply tired driving down the road. Could have been... An, 
variety of explainable occurrences. But if you don't have the appropriate insurance money to for them to collect after and to be made whole from, then they're going to look at your personal assets. Mm-hmm. And and that's where they're going to be forced to be driven to to go and to collect and and to to be made whole from this injury, and so even you know, kind of going to back to what we talked about practical application when we're looking at kind of the tools that we have right. Um, so something that this client could have done very easily is, you know, and we talked about this a lot in our last podcast. And if you didn't you know, check that out. I, I'd encourage you to go do it is having your, you know, real estate in an LLC, right? By having your real estate in an LLC that is given its own business entity. Now, in order, if I'm involved in a personal lawsuit, a car accident or a contract dispute, something um, to get access to that and to, to the equity of that business, you have to now pierce the corporate veil. That is a separate lawsuit that has to be done it is, you know, litigation expenses that have to be fronted, and all of these things make it more difficult to get and uh, protects the underlying investment of the interest. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of different things, and, and asset protection is probably the most important thing for you know that lower tier of wealth up until probably about ten million dollars. And that's when I think the conversation starts to shift slightly more towards, um, depending on their age, you know, hey, let looking at other things such as, you know, estate tax planning, income tax planning, all of those things. I think up until that threshold, asset protection is probably the most important concept that is going to be yeah. um, probably the biggest driver of lost sleep. Um, so, so for that, that lower, the lower group we're in right now, right. Or even mm-hmm. this household, right. The, the beginning conversation on asset protection is one insurances, right. Like mm-hmm. auto, homeowners umbrella and having the right coverages done there right like that's a a part about it i guess you could say disability and life insurance still because if you consider your income an asset which i do disability insurance is really important so that that's there and then this is same person right like that triplex should be in an llc that that seems like a no-brainer to me again you know we talked about this last last episode especially in california people skip this because of an 800 dollars a year fee which is just like I'm sure this household wishes that they would pay $100 so they wouldn't have as much to worry about here. And then I think the last layer, and maybe it's not, maybe it's actually the top layer is even around bank accounts and investments being at the right places, right? Like, you know, you have $5 million in one bank account and that bank goes down, you don't have FDIC insurance covering it. So whether that means spread across, whether that means using other places that have higher FDIC limits, like that is still another part of asset protection that maybe people ignore. 100%. Um, And even, you know, taking that one step farther is how is that asset at that bank titled, right? If it's in your name or in your revocable living trust, that's effectively treated as cash that a creditor could easily gain access to. So again, there's also kind of this further concept, and and this is especially prevalent in California because certain, um, in, in one thing in particular for this client is that you know, state law has a big role to play in asset protection. And specifically here in California, if we have large unqualified retirement accounts, right? So, you know, individually established IRAs, or if there are a um, qualified retirement account that we commingle with an unqualified account through a series of rollovers, which you're saying happen all your the 401k to your IRA. Moving a 401k to an IRA and then also, you know, commingling that with um, non-qualified retirement accounts. So, you know, there's, if you do a 401k and you roll it over into an IRA and don't add anything else to it, and we can trace that this came from a qualified retirement account with no additional contributions, then it'll likely still be protected under federal law. But in California, non-qualified retirement accounts are not protected. And so in this particular case with this particular client, you know, they have a half a million dollars in an IRA, which is very common to see nowadays, you know, large, large IRA policies, but under California law, those are not protected from the claims of third-party creditors. 
yeah, it's discretionary is, up to what the judge determines and what the judge says. Yeah, which um, I mean, I mean, it makes it two reasons. Like, I I really don't see a reason to be rolling four hundred one k's into IRAs unless you're retired. Retired, right? If you're still working, it eliminates the ability to do backdoor Roths, and two, it opens yourself up to a new liability risk that it's not as protected um, for many reasons. One hundred percent. And so when um, you know, to kind of go back to your initial point is yes, we have to look at how much money we're keeping in banks, what's the total uh, aggregate value of the account, do we have FDIC insurance, and then taking that conversation one step forward, which is, you know, hey, how are these accounts titled? And is this type of account protected from an asset protection standpoint, right? That's where, you know, and, and we see this in cases where you know, this will pro can probably take us out of, you know, the, the normal traditional one to $3 million client. But if we have a $5 million, you know, brokerage account, right, just a typical non-retirement brokerage account that, you know, we're trading and investing, um, that's an unprotected asset. And we should look at, are there different things and different mechanisms that we can use to provide at least some measure of protection, right? Let's Personal holding- it. Personal holding company is probably the easiest first step process. You know, naturally that process is going to be a little bit more difficult now that we're layering in the reporting requirements of the Corporate Transparency Act, all of those, you know, fun unintended consequences of, of so those laws. Are there issues with doing that? Like obviously like LLCs are set up and besides the tax benefits of like hobby loss rules, right? Like you can't just have an LLC report losses, et cetera. But if you're holding any, creating any of these companies, is there any issues to just like putting money inside of them, but really doing nothing with them? Do they become a disregarded entity in any way? Well, so anytime we create a business entity, there's always two components. Right. There's the tax component and then there is the liability shield component. Right. And those are two separate things. For sure. And so you can have a disregarded entity from a tax standpoint where all of the taxes will flow through to your personal income statement. That doesn't change the liability protection of the entity itself. Right. Because that's that's completely separate. So there are still things that we have to do when we create a personal holding company. We have to show that it is you know, acting as a business. Um, and so how do you show that in that example with somebody with a, you know, $10 million brokerage account? Sure. Um, you know, one thing that you are not required to do, but I encourage all of my clients to do is adhere to the corporate formalities, right? So have an annual meeting. Um, the business itself, when we have a personal holding company, or in this case, let's just narrow it down to a personal investment company. It's a company that is designed to manage your investments. Great. Um, when you are hiring your investment advisor, your investment advisor is now managing the assets of Christopher Guy Holdings, LLC. Mm -hmm. um, you are having an annual meeting with your advisor and you are going to be taking minutes, right? Um, if you have to, if you need access to those funds, you're going to write a check from your business account, the LLC to yourself personally, because we're not going to have personal expenses come out of this account. And so long as we adhere to those corporate formalities, and there's other things that we can do to strengthen it, right? Um, Multi-member LLCs are given uh, more protection generally in most states than single member LLCs. So if there's an opportunity to give you know, a 1% interest to your kids, great. Now we have a multi-member LLC, which has afforded even more protection under lo the laws of most states. And, um, and in that context, yeah, you can have the disregarded component of um, the tax structure. But at the same time, since you are still treating this like a business, um, you don't necessarily need accounts receivable. You don't need a lot of, you know, personal expense, or, or I should say business expenditures and complex tax filings in order to gain the liability shield that comes with, you know, paying your $800 fee file, or I should say $800 in California, filing the necessary documentation with the secretary of state that you incorporate in. Um, and, and so I think that is kind of one big misconception is that, Hey, uh, the, the tax and the liability components are merged. No, they're, they're, they're separate. Um, you could be taxed as an S corp or a C corp. Um, 
And if you don't adhere to the formalities or if you're treating this business as personal expenditures or just an, an extension of your personal finances, then at that point in time, yeah, you can get, you know, there are ways to pierce that corporate veil. But so long as we maintain, you know, minimal amounts of discipline and how we are um, conducting transfers between the accounts, then 100%, it's super easy to do and uh, provides a significant amount of protection. Um, when you think of, you know, the underlying burden, right, is pay, paying the filing fee, having an annual meeting. Well, if you're working with an advisor and if you have $5 million in a portfolio, you should be having an annual meeting with your advisor anyway, right? Um, and so it's it's not difficult to do, but will provide a substantial amount of protection. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense to me. What other things do we start to consider for this? Um, well, at, at the $5 million range, I think you also start to consider... Um, various types of trusts, right? Because good asset protection will kind of be like layers. And if you think of, you know, old castles and keeps, right? There's usually an exterior wall, you know, then there's a larger inner gate, then there's, you know, the walls get bigger, they get thicker, they get stronger. Um, and we have multiples of them, right? Because if one wall is pierced, we don't want to open up all of the assets, because the one wall has been breached. And so cool, you know, business entities that will usually be, you know, the first line of defense. Um, from there, you start to layer in other things and it will kind of depend on the client and depend on the objectives. You can go, you can look at, you know, domestic asset protection trusts, um, even various types of estate tax planning strategies will provide protection by virtue of being irrevocable trusts. But I'd say um, uh, domestic asset protection trusts are kind of a big one. Those are relatively mm -hmm. new. Can you go into more detail on those? I don't think the average person probably is even a clue what they mean or what they do or the upside, like the benefits or, the, or like what are the downsides? Um, the downsides is so anytime we have more protection, um, the way that we access the money has to change and it has to get more complicated. Yeah. It's not like a right? bank account. You're not moving money from your savings account to your checking account. It's not that easy. No, it's not, you know, it's not as simple as, you know, logging into your online banking, you know, and selecting the two accounts that you transfer from and you click execute. Um, a domestic asset protections trust is a, uh, trust that a person creates from the, themselves. It's a self-settled, um, Grant or trust, which means uh, it's still taxable to that person. So this isn't a strategy that you'd use for estate tax mitigation techniques. Um, but and under the laws, own, you pay your own personal tax rate, not trust tax rate. Yes. Okay. Um, and so when we have these types of trusts, um, the sole purpose why we're we're doing this type of trust is for asset protection. There's a bunch of different states that have enacted these laws. Um, which allow you to protect the assets placed in this trust and provides um, a deeper, higher level of protection. It is a derivative from international asset protection trust, which would kind of be, I guess, the next step, the next tier higher, if you want, you know, I guess the best protection affordable under laws is you go international. There's small little countries that have created these fun international asset protection treaties and laws that make it extremely difficult for a third party to break into. Um, the domestic version, which is, you know, anything based in the United States, uh, South Dakota is a big jurisdiction for this, Nevada, Alaska, those types of things. Um, and really they've found to be very protective unless you're dealing with one of two contexts which is all usually going to involve the federal government, um, bankruptcy pr proceedings, and uh, anytime you're dealing with the IRS. Those are the only two times what, that we have, you know, several case laws saying, "Hey, these things failed; they didn't work," is in those contexts. Um, but it's a trust that you create for yourself, and you put assets in it, um, and we go through the process of transferring these assets into this trust. And they are using and they're given a significant amount of protection under state laws. And then when we layer 
entity planning, right? LLCs, personal hold, holding companies, investment companies, properly structuring your business or your investment properties, again, using business entities, you create kind of a, um, uh, a very secure plan, right? Where the entities themselves are protected from one another's by virtue of having their own business entities. And then you have the domestic asset protection trust on, on top, which is going to secure all of the underlying assets and, and secure it from your personal liability. Um, we're getting kind of in, into the weeds here. It is a pretty complex structure. I'd say before someone is looking at this, you know, they're going to be, uh, you know, four or $5 million plus minimum, um, unless they are in, you know, a highly litigious um, profession. Yeah. Right. So I've seen, you know, lawyers, we have these types of things. We will enact them earlier. Sure. Doctors. Yes. You know, you think of kind of the uh, of those, you know, highly litigious professions where the risk of being sued is, is well, higher. This is an interesting thing that I've been dealing with a lot is <clears throat> I'm starting to work with more and more doctors, I would say. And a lot of them have their primary job, you know, a hospital, their W-2, they have malpractice, you know, they have you know, all the insurance they need through work. But then they also typically have like 1099 roles, right? Where they set up, you know, they set up an LLC, good step one, obviously, but they don't have the insurances protecting them when they go work at other hospitals. Right. And and they don't think about it because they just know they have it over here and they don't realize the risk of like, Oh, I'm going over here and seeing patients, but I don't have anything pro protecting me if I get sued for X, you know, Y and Z reason. And that's really kind of what the whole purpose behind asset protection is, is actually looking at things and evaluating it specifically from that lens, because in all likelihood, the biggest, uh, most catastrophic um, thing that can happen in a person's life is an unexpected unplanned lawsuit that you don't have any underlying insurance coverage for or don't have enough insurance for. This is this is what goes back to the Morgan Housel quote. Like everybody talks about risk of like, what, what, you know, so much risk. What if the stock market drops 20 percent? He's like, risk isn't the things that we can expect, right? Like, you know, to expect over your lifetime market fluctuations and X, Y, and Z, but real risk are the things that we don't foresee and we don't plan for. And, and this is the biggest one. And, I, and unfortunately, it's becoming um, even more necessary uh, because every year more and more lawsuits are filed. Um, I, I heard a couple of attorneys give a couple of great quotes and they say, you know, there's, there's really only three ways that you can create wealth or you can get wealthy. One is to go out and earn it. The other is to um, inherit it, right? Earning it's hard to do. You got to go out and work. Inherit, it is, inheriting it, it. Yes, exactly. Is, you know, if, if you inherit, that's entirely lucky. And the third is to go out and take it from someone who's done one or two. Um, and in, in as silly as that sounds, it, it's that's very much how we're seeing it played out. And right? there's a if lot of people who do live in number three, right? I mean, there's, it's always crazy to me. Like I grew up in not an area or like a group of people that like suing anybody else, you know, is like something people think about. It's kind of like X, Y, Z happened. Like, let's figure it out. Like we don't care about it. And then there's like plenty of groups of people in the U S who are literally like, if we have an option to sue, you better bet we're taking that option. Like any chance of doing this that we can look for, we're going to take. 100%. And uh, it's also because of the the burden of proof needed to initiate a lawsuit in the United States is super low. And so um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that there are frivolous lawsuits, but as we start to accumulate wealth, we become a bigger target. We have better insurance. Um, we have more assets and so theoretically, even if someone didn't have a great lawsuit to begin with, they may file it anyway, just so that they can get, you know, $150,000, $200,000 settlement of which that they don't have to pay anything to do because the they can go and they can find an attorney and work on contingency and they'll front the cost of litigation for the next two years. And so it literally costs this person nothing and they stand to benefit upwards of tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Meanwhile, if you're on the receiving end of this, and if you haven't taken the time to protect and secure your assets, there's not a single attorney in the country who is going to defend you on a contingency basis. Doesn't exist, right? So you're going to have to pay an attorney hourly 
to go through this process. Meanwhile, if you don't have good insurance and underlying asset protection, you open up the entirety of your net worth to these lawsuits. And I see it all the time, especially with corporate stocks, right? Um, a lot of people don't know corporate stock that you own in a company can be seized by a creditor, which means if you're sued and you have you hold stock certificates, which is kind of the blessing and the curse of stock certificates, is that they can easily be traded hands, right? That's why they're so big in um, uh, kind of private equity, the startup world, like, no, I want to buy stock, right? Because that private equity company that purchased stock in your company can then turn and sell it to another private equity company. There's no, you know, membership approval, nothing like that. It's just, you know, freely changing hands. And that's the same exact thing of what happens in creditors' claims and creditors' disputes. If you don't have the underlying protection and if you're sued and if you don't have the cash to, to come up with the money for the lawsuit, then great. They're like, well, we'll take a portion or all of the certificates of stock in the company that you've spent the last 10 years building. And so, and more and more of these lawsuits are popping up every single day. There's a couple of, you know, just um, news articles and, and headlines that are popping up from just this week um, that specifically highlight this. Um, and we see it kind of day in and day out. It's just, you know, it's almost one of those things where we also think, oh, that'll never happen to me. Um, and I hear great. that from, I hear it from every single one of my clients. That's mm -hmm. never going to happen. Um, and I hope that they're right, but I don't base my future and I'm not going to risk, you know, all of the hard work that I've put into my business and in, in, in building my assets and my portfolio on the hope or expectation that I'm never going to get sued in the future. Yeah. Right. Because that that's something that's completely out of your hands and out of your control because it may not even be you, you know, another big common example that I see very often. Um, and I don't know if this is kind of as prominent as you, but um, keeping kids on car insurance for way too long, right? Um, as from an asset protection standpoint, as soon as your kids turn 18 years old, they need to have their own insurance policy. Because if they're still on your insurance as the primary insurance uh, carrier for that person, you are inadvertently bringing yourself into a lawsuit if your kid ever gets into a car accident. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Right? And also taking, you know, having your parents' name on title to your vehicle. There's different theories of liability. So, you know, if you are paying for your child's vehicle and they're 21 years old, there is a thing called negligent entrustment of a vehicle. Right? As so the owner of that vehicle, you are responsible and liable for how that car is operated to a degree. But the parents could still pay the insurance for the kids. One hundred percent, their own insurance. So it's just like a easy step, like no reason not to really be doing that. Well, is this also, and that? What about and that's something like, that you talked about last week, right? Um, you have, you can give your kids up to seventeen thousand dollars a year, um, free and clear, gift taxes, right? I insurance will will encompass you know a very very small it. margin of it, right? You know, you're talking. Um, to get adequate insurance for your 18 year old, maybe a thousand bucks a year, 2000, if they have a bad driving history. Is um, there a risk? So like, let's say I'm 40. Um, I've always just kept getting new insurances and I've always just left my parents on my policy, but like they don't drive. Is there, there's not really any risk there. Is there, I didn't sure. know if you were saying something like that. Yeah. 100%. If they do something on a different car and a different policy. No. But if It'd you got, it, but, but, but if you're, if, if you, so it, when you get your policy, right. Are you talking about having your parents as secondary insureds on your policy? Yeah. Then no, okay. only if you're, but if your parents then drove one of your vehicles. Yeah. Right. If you gave them the keys to your, one of the cars that you own and they go and get in a car accident, then yes. Now you could be brought into that lawsuit, yeah. right? So the common context that I see this is, right, is you have successful family, buy kids a car when they turn 18. Okay, cool. Um, kid had no credit, so dad bought the car. Dad's Mom and dad are the owners of the vehicle. Kid is going to college, doesn't have a job, so mom and dad are paying for the insurance on the vehicle. Mom and dad own the vehicle, they pay for the insurance, kid gets in a car accident. 
mom and dad are going to be involved in the lawsuit, even though mom and dad have never driven that car. All they did was pay for it. And so even things like that is, you know, things and examples that we don't really think of when the solution is actually super simple. Perfect. Gift in the it's car. Gift in the car. It's kid's car. Perfect. Here you go. Here's the gift. Title um, in their name. Titles in their name. You get an insurance policy in their name. It literally costs the parents effectively nothing because you're just removing them from your insurance, yep. getting them their own insurance. So you're still paying for insurance. Um, but now if the child gets in a car accident, you're not jeopardizing all of mom and dad's wealth and that kids they've have accumulated none. during their lifetime and kids have none. So what does that encourage the person who is suing them to do? Take the insurance money and then go away, yeah. which is the whole purpose of asset protection to begin with. That's why, you know, step one is looking at, okay, let's look at their, their balance sheet. Let's look at their financial statement. A financial plan is immensely helpful in this because it's going to be super detailed. It's going to outline, you know, assets, liabilities, all of those things, right? Let's look at the, the financial plan. Let's look at the insurance coverage. And now let's look at how we can best secure the assets from an asset protection standpoint, either encumbering the property, locking it behind entities or gifting it away, depending on the level of net worth. And when you have all of those three things kind of working in harmony with one another, it all, it all encourages the same result is, hey, let's have an adequate insurance. Let's get the person who's suing us to take the insurance money. And then let's go about our the rest of our lives. Yeah, right? I think the way that you're framing this, I think is really good because I think the way that people view insurance is let me view each insurance policy make sure I have it. And like, is there any problems versus I think if you reframe this to be like, what are the the gaps or the risks in my life? Right. The, these risks are like something happens with your kids and it causes a lawsuit. Right. Then you go to, well, how do you fill that? Right. So they go to these new policies, right. My policies need to be maxed out like here. But I think if you go straight to review each insurance, you're missing out on getting people on finding the problem and why it's solved by that. I think you're doing a really great job of framing it that way. Thank you. Um, it, but that's that's really how you, you should look at it, right? Is um, from that kind of top-down view of, hey, uh, and that's why, you know, umbrella insurance is, is a hugely powerful tool, um, is, right, it can kind of come and it can kind of fill some of these potential gaps in, in these areas. Um, as long as you max but, out those other policies first. As long as there's sufficient liability limits to actually engage the umbrella policy. Yes. Um, but we never stop. And, and here is one big mistake that I see um, very often is, hey, I have these insurance policies, right? I've done step one. I, I got my financial plan. We reviewed the insurance coverages and brought them all to appropriate levels, right? Um, why do I need to do asset protection? Right. If I've done steps one and two and I'm in a adequately insured, then why do I need to even go down this road? Um, and it's something that I hear all the time, but here's the problem with insurance. And this is why, you know, asset protection is still, in my opinion, mandatory for anyone who has, you know, significant levels of wealth um, or hopes to be there one day is insurance has exclusions and insurance has policy limits. Right. Um, so what happens if that car accident just happened to be a really, really bad car accident and you hit the wrong person and that person is Jeff Bezos. And now Jeff Bezos, who's a billionaire, is now a quadriplegic. His loss of earning cap capacity has you know, detrimentally been affected. And now you're hit with an insanely large lawsuit. The two million dollar, three million dollar, ten million dollar umbrella insurance policy isn't going to do you. And that's why we always have to layer this, right? Now this is where asset protection comes into play is that, hey, there is a lot of insurance money here for you guys to go after and for the insurance companies to fight over, right? They're going to pay for the defense costs. They're going to come up with you know the settlement money. Um, and then we make the remaining amount of our assets as difficult as possible for a creditor to break into so that it is no longer worth it for the other side to continue fighting. Yeah. It makes sense. I don't think people think about those scenarios, right? I think like most people don't think about the like, oh, I have auto, like what about above that? And then if they do, they're like, well, I have umbrella and I'm good. But 
I think that's a really good example of, I mean, who knows? I mean, you in California, plenty of wealthy people, plenty of people making a lot of money. Or what if you had a really nice car with four people in it, right? Like, I mean, you just don't know. Yeah. I, I you know, I actually just saw something on Twitter uh, recently, you know, a small dent in a Rivian cost the person $40,000 to fix. I just um, right. Yeah. And, you know, crazy stuff, especially with, you know, how expensive cars are getting. It's not uncommon, at least in Southern California to see, you know, super nice cars that cost, you know, well into the six figures. Um, and all of these things, you know, things getting more expensive, medical care getting more expensive, um, more lawsuits being filed every single year, year over year. All of these things are kind of driving people to consider and to actively participate in securing their wealth. Whereas I don't think it's probably, it, it hasn't been as necessary in previous years, right? Yeah. In previous years, it was just basically, hey, we're going to do, you know, our foundational estate planning. Um, and then we can, you know, by and large, not really worry about um, asset protection until we get to, you know, estate tax planning, if we have an estate tax problem, which, yeah. you know, 15, 20 years ago was a big thing because the estate tax exemption limits were a lot lower. Um, but now with the estate tax exemption limits being higher, more lawsuits being filed and more people kind of fitting into this, you know, middle category, asset protection is is the most and, and biggest concern for most of my clients. Because again, you yeah. don't get to the high levels of net worth without having and, and securing your assets. Um, Definitely. Otherwise you just stand to lose it. all. Yeah, no, totally agree. Um, as we wrap up, one thing I want to re-hit on that I love that you talked about is like the why me mentality or like not why me, like, oh, I get that'll happen, but it's not going to happen to me mentality. And I've been sharing this with clients as I like bring up different insurances and things because that's everybody's viewpoint. They're like, oh, like I get that, you know, somebody that had cancer in their thirties, but like that won't happen to me. Or yeah, I get that somebody could be in a bad accident, but I'm a good driver. Right. Or, you know, but we recently came across somebody who they were a doctor, a surgeon, and they got an offender vendor. It was them, their fault. They like accidentally fender bender hit them, broke both their hands. Never can be a surgeon again, like early on in their career. And I think people think like, you know, it has to be this crazy drastic thing to happen, but it doesn't really always have to be like something that seems so small and like probably wouldn't impact that many people just got unlucky and he'll never be able to use really his hands again for any form of it. Right. And if that person doesn't have own occupation disability insurance, they lost their entire income potential sitting with tons of student loans. Well, and I think that's what people don't realize or understand is that these things can happen, um, one, without your consent, and you don't even have to be a major player in it, right? It, it, it can literally have nothing. Uh, the circumstances can be completely beyond your control, and someone will still try to you know, take what is yours. Or in this case, you know, um, I had something very similar happen, but it was actually to my dad. Right. Um, my dad's a dentist. He's been a dentist for you know 35 years, long time. Um, and he had thankfully, you know, his advisor um in their series of discussions had had convinced him to get disability insurance. Um and he paid for it for you know 28 years. Complain about paying for it all the time. Of course. Uh, and then he was walking across the street as a pedestrian in Newport Beach, California. And he was hit by a motorcyclist um, while he was a walking pedestrian, right? Um, open fracture in his leg, broken hand, whole bunch of stuff. And he ended up being out of work for a year and a half. Um, again, my dad was convinced that he was flushing money down the drain. This is completely you know, a waste of time and a waste of money until it's not. Exactly. And my dad had absolutely no control over what happened or, you know, it was, you know, five seconds had he left the store earlier from getting his cough medicine on his way, walking across the street to get dinner or five seconds later, he doesn't get hit by this motorcyclist. But in this arena, we don't have the luxury of hindsight 2020. 
Um, it's either we're prepared or we're not prepared. And if you're prepared for those instances and those lawsuits, you put yourself in the best possible position to weather it. And so thankfully my dad in his case, you know, he had disability insurance. He had these underlying things because he ended up being out of work for almost 18 months. Um, and you know, that also happened around, you know, 2009. So, mm -hmm. um, all the crazy like stuff you. in the housing. Yeah. You know, terrible time. And he had just bought a house in 2007. Um, and, uh, in, in the same thing goes for asset protection. Most people think, oh, this is never going to happen to me. And, you know, I had that conversation with my client who again, well into the eighties. So we're talking late eighties. He was still, you know, driving his car and the client that I mentioned kind of at the beginning of this podcast, who's involved in this car accident. He went 80 something years of his life, 70 years operating a motor vehicle, nothing like this ever happened. And then one moment, one instance changed it all and changed everything. And now because he never gauged an asset protection, there's very little that you can do yeah. to protect the underlying assets. Yeah. Um, and so this is very much a preventative space um, and hopefully you don't have to use it. And in which case, you know, if we're looking at the amount of money that asset protection costs people, um, it's usually not a lot. And depending on kind of the overall net worth of the client and the strategies that we have to impose, you know, it's going to let, you know, it's, it, it's the amount of money is going to be a fraction of what you will spend on yeah, you know, exactly. a variety of different expenditures in your lifetime. It's right? funny. It's, it's it, like, I was just gonna say, it's funny. Like people will be like, oh, I don't want to get term life insurance. Like what if I just pay all that money and like, I never get it paid back. And I'm like, then you'll be really happy. Like if yeah, you, totally if your doesn't get paid out the insurance money, you'll be really happy. And if they do, they're gonna be really sad. Why? But they're gonna be really happy that you had it. Like, it's just, that's just how all of it works. Yeah. Uh, and especially, you know, along that line, so, right. Term and life insurance for over the cost of a 20 year policy, you're going to pay 10, $15,000 over 20 years. For a good Great. amount of coverage, if that's quite yeah. Good, yeah. But if you pass away in one year, like your your family is going to get a, a very very large check, um, which that is need. that they will one hundred percent need, depending on context and yeah. But yeah, man, I hopefully that through the end of this, I mean, we gave some good education and probably a little bit of scaring people into why they need to do this. And sometimes there's really no better way to push urgency in people than to share real life stories and kind of scare them into it. Um, but I really appreciate you coming on, man. You shared a lot of really valuable insights. Um, I'm sure we're going to have you back on for part three next year. Um, but before we end, kind of let everybody know best places to follow you. Yeah. Uh, best place to follow me is going to be on Twitter. That's that's usually where I spend most of my time when I'm not in my office or with my kids. Um, and it's going to be at Christopher Geip. And uh, Thomas, thank you for having me on. Um, hopefully, you know, they they got some value and some actionable steps on on what to do. Um, and, uh, always, always happy to come back and always happy to be a guest. Yeah. Well, thanks man. And everybody, thank you for listening. Um, we're getting up to like 45 star reviews. So I'd really appreciate if you enjoy this podcast, if you would, uh, go leave a review, um, we'll see you back next week. <laughs>